five days of crushing mobs and stinky, sweaty people. I stayed up for this over the space of two years, and when I arrived, I realized that money was just going to be the tip of the iceberg of what this adventure was really going to cost me. It has been a test of endurance, willpower, time management, smart budgeting, and luck. There are movie stars, famous directors, and over a thousand other wonders, all fit in the San Diego, San Diego Convention Center with a pressure and intensity that threatened to pop the roof off the place like a giant, festering zit. Uh, much like the ones covering the faces of half the people here. <laughs> this is Inter Comic Con Inter International. Ground zero for all things sci fi, fantasy, and comic book related. And a geek magnet the likes of the world will hopefully never be able to replicate. Individuals have varied interests. They may range from a simple hobby to an overall addiction. The Young Man in Geek Fight by Bradley Walton is one of these individuals. He travels to Comic Con to bask in the company of people who are just like him. Let's see how his day goes in Geek Fight. I spend far more money on comic books than I probably should. A reality to which my mere presence at this convention is unquestionably the ultimate testament. The freshly purchased rare comic book now nestled on a mylar sleeve and tucked safely in my backpack is a close second. I'm not ashamed of this. I'm not a geek. I have a life and family. This is simply my hobby and I thoroughly enjoy it. As much as I love comic books, however, I avoid the company of people who actually read them. Individuals who live vicariously through the exploits of fictional characters on online message boards. These are adults with no social skills who go to online message boards and make snide comments about Spider-Man's web shooters. All hiding in the safety of their parents' basements behind screen names like Mr. Tauntaun 47. These are people who have heard of soap, but have never actually tried to use it. These individuals have nothing worthwhile to say in real life, and even less to say on the internet. And at this moment, two of them are standing right in front of me, having a heated argument over who would win in a fight between <coughs> Daredevil and Boba Fett. The guy arguing in favor of Daredevil is just a character from some anime that I hope I am never able to correctly identify although I have a suspicion that it may or may not be Sailor Moon. Ah, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Japanese schoolgirl costumes look all alike to me. There are those who might accuse me of cultural apathy, or maybe even racism for not grasping the nuance of the question. Those people need to get a life. What I find particularly striking about the specimen in front of me is how the two days worth of beard, bro beard growth crashes with the blue iridescent strands of the hair that covers his head and cascades down his back. <laughs> Arguing in favor of Boba Fett is an OB stormtrooper. His armor splotched with a bizarre color pattern that I don't recognize. Maybe he modeled after some obscure trooper squadron from a video game or a comic book. Or somebody just simply barfed orange soda on him at the concession stand. <laughs> he speaks with a, a fire and brimstone passion that makes most Southern Baptist priests quiver with inferiority. It's like listening to Martin Luther King Jr. speak about jetpacks, flamethrowers, and womp wrestling, all laced with a, a steady string of F-bombs that would have made Kevin Smith proud. It seems that Boba Fett's ignominious demise at the, hand, at the hands of the blind Han Solo in Return of the Jedi did not escape the no, notice of the man in the short skirt and long blue wig. He argues, not unreasonably, that if Boba Fett bare fit his eyesight, could take down Boba Fett without having the superpower of Daredevil's radar-like sixth sense, then Daredevil himself could easily accomplish the same task. So I'm telling ya, Boba Fett's a big wuss. I haven't read our since means you got radar. Nobody can whack your jetpack with, that, with no pull without you knowing about it. And if Boba Fett got himself whacked the pull, then he's whacked. That's all there is to it. Han was blind and didn't have no reflexes. And Daredevil got killer reflexes, so if Han ain't got no reflexes, and they both can't see, then Daredevil ought to be able to do the same. <laughs> the, the, obe the obese vomit trooper disagrees, citing with instantaneous recollection and rigid conviction that Boba Fett escaped from the Sarlacc pit in Marvel's in the issue number 81 of Marvel Comics Star Wars series that was published when he, he was of an age that he was proud that he did not have a girlfriend. Uh, his words can't exactly be repeated in polite company, so I shall substitute the name of Anakin Skywalker's slave master from Star Wars Episode One, Watto, in place of any non-family friendly words that he may have implied. Wow, that Watto! Wattoing Devlin got half the Wattoing style of Wattoing Boba Fett. 
Bubble watering fat oozes watering cool out of every watering part of his watering body. Ain't no watering body gets a drop on the watering fat. Watering hug got one like he cheap shot. It didn't even count because the fat, he got the water of that water. So water you! <laughs> I watched in a mixture of amusement, alarm, and disgust as the conversation at first progresses, then escalates like some geek cold war. Uh, without the proliferation of nuclear weapons, though, the parties involved dig deeper into the virtues they espouse. At first, I'm convinced that this is a contest that the man in the shirt, in the skirt, and long blue wig will surely win. Daredevil having debuted a good 14 years before FET, therefore having more time to accumulate a history. However, the knowledge of the Vomit Trooper is vast. It soon becomes apparent that there's no video game that has gone unplayed, no action figure uncollected, no comic book has gone uncollected, and no tab of a pop-up book has gone unpulled. And it's all committed into a database of memories so vast and efficient that if it could be packaged and sold, it would make a truly desirable Walmart doorbuster on the morning after Thanksgiving, <laughs> if it were priced cheaply enough. As, a, as his array of knowledge begins to fail him, the man in the skirt and long blue wig becomes increasingly more agitated. Beads of sweat appear on his forehead and slide down his face, an ominous pointer to the fall that soon must come to this burly, pantyhose-clad warrior. But as his mind falters, his muscles grow tense with the, beneath the sheer white sleeves. He means to win this contest one way or another. I step back. Violence is never a pretty thing, and what unfolds now is no exception. The man in the dress punches the stormtrooper, then cradles his fist and swears that the trooper falls onto his armored rear. A circle forms around the surrounding mob of people, step back to watch a mixture of horror and amusement. Several cell phones and a, a digital camcorder appear above the heads of the crowd. If the trooper has any sense, he'll leave his helmet on. The man in the dress has no such recourse. In all, he would be ashamed forever if he had any friends or a socialite to speak of. In all likelihood, he does not, and this event will have no lasting impact for him. His undeveloped social skills and unbridled geekiness armoring and insulating him, as surely as the sturdiest of Stormtrooper helmets. I contemplate this scene before me, wondering what chain of events could bring a man to a point in his life such as this, where, dressed in an absurd costume, comes to blows with another man in an equally absurd costume over a matter of absolutely no importance. My mind is immediately filled with a dozen parallels stretching from the present to the future, or present back through history. Men outfitted in armor and costumes of their cultures, fighting violently over abstract matters of personal belief, politics or imaginary lines that differentiate one piece of land from another. And at this moment, I realize that this convention is its own multi cultural microcosm. The geeks are its citizens, and they're representative of the rest of the world, whether they like it or not. When the punch was thrown, I had been about to thank the heavens that it was nothing like these two nut jobs. <laughs> Moments later, my certainty was flagged. A hairy leg encased in a thin layer of flesh-colored nylon crashes into me, knocking me backwards in the crowd. In the brief heartbeat it takes for a stormtrooper to headbutt an anime drag queen into a crowd of gawking bystanders, I realize how easy that could be drawn into their pointless brawl. Although, so many comic books feature heroes and villains garbed in bright colors and costumes engaged in seemingly eternal physical conflict. In this moment, I find peace within myself, secure in the knowledge that I am indeed a higher life form than these two freaks. I am filled with a profound and sublime joy that immediately evacuates my body to make room for rising gut-twisting panic as I rip open the zipper of my backpack to examine the contents within. Panic turns itself into horror. Despite its protective mylar sheath, the comic book for which I had just paid $700 just minutes ago has sustained a one-eighth inch crease in the crease in its upper right hand corner, easily devaluing it by at least 30%. I grab a Batman mask off of some guy standing next to me, and covering my face, I join in the brawl. <laughs>